Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. My guest this week is a country music rarity and that she was actually born and raised in Nashville. She grew up with musician parents who let her hang out backstage at the Grand Ole Opry as a kid. But little did she know that one day she'd be inducted into country music's most prestigious club. I posted this video on social media of calling my mom, FaceTiming her to take her down to the wall where all of our names are engraved and all these plaques of all of the members of the Grand Ole Opry. And I got to show her the plaque and she had to pull over in the car. And I mean, it was just this really amazing thing to get to share with her. Hillary Scott performed both in her church and with her family growing up and was attempting to get her solo career off the ground when she met her eventual bandmates in Lady A, Charles Kelly and Dave Haywood in 2006. The trio has now been recording and touring the world for 15 years, earning five Grammys and multiple ACM, CMA, and Billboard Music Awards. On today's show, Hillary talks about what's kept Lady A together so long, her relationship with her grandfather, and some of her favorite down-home meals, like chicken bog. All that and more this week on Biscuits and Jam. Well, Hillary Scott, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and looking forward to all the things we get to talk about. Well, listen, I wanted to start out by saying congrats on being inducted into the Grand Ole Opry. Thank you. And by Darius Rucker, no less. Yes, and we have done... Gosh, I think two headlining tours with Darius over the years. He's truly one of our closest friends in country music and a huge influence for Charles specifically growing up. And it was an amazing surprise, to say the least. I'm born and raised here in Nashville. Both my parents moved to Nashville from their hometowns to pursue country music specifically. And if you had asked my mama when she was 19, why are you moving to Nashville other than to pursue country music. And she would say to play on the Grand Ole Opry. So to have that moment and to be able to call her, I posted this video on social media of calling my mom, FaceTiming her to take her down to the wall where all of our names are engraved and all these plaques of all of the members of the Grand Ole Opry. And I got to show her the plaque and she had to pull over in the car. And I mean, it was just this really amazing thing to get to share with her. Oh, that's so great. I mean, so your mom is a Grammy-winning artist, Linda Davis, and your dad, Lang Scott, Yes, is a very successful songwriter and musician. And in a way, you kind of grew up at the Opry. I mean, do you have memories of being backstage there or, you know, just bumping into Dolly Parton? (laughs) It's funny. It wasn't until a couple years ago that I actually met Dolly. She was one of the last, just who I would say is just the, you know, full-blown legend that I had had a chance to meet, especially as Opry members go. But yes, I have a ton of memories of being backstage at the Opry. It was such a part of my life growing up, not only because of my mom and dad being in the industry, but then there are friends, you know, And, and that's, I think, a lot of times the backstage Opry experience. A lot of people don't know. I mean, you'll just have friends show up, other artists show up in support of you just because they want to come see you play the Opry. It's a time to hang out. There's some downtime backstage. It's just a great hang, you know? And so I have a lot of memories of Jeannie Seeley and Connie Smith and meeting Marty Stewart and Ricky Skaggs. So it's been a huge part of my of my life and I would say too that that being backstage at the Opry and experiencing that my parents have been fans of bluegrass and and traditional country their whole life but I got to see that I think a lot more firsthand when I was there when I would experience those Opry nights which must have made such a huge impression on you but for you it was just you must have just thought well this is what it's like to be 7 years old <laughs> it was it was such a a bizarre way to to grow up. But it is, to your point, it's all that I really knew. It feels like such in the fiber of, of who I am from birth. So it is. It's it's definitely where I've always been, truly. So Hillary, this show's called Biscuits and Jam, and we always talk a little bit about food. And one question that I often ask 
is, you know, who was the cook in your family? But I have to guess that your mom and dad were on the road yes. quite a bit. Did they ever have time to cook or does one of them love to cook? So both of them can cook and they have things that they do really, really well. My mom, I would say it, it was kind of a joke in our house growing up. Like there's about two hands worth of things that she feels super confident in being able to prepare for our family. And one of them being this like homemade chicken pot pie that is like when I'm just really missing just that nostalgia of childhood, I'm like, mom, can you make me a chicken pot pie? And it's one of the things that she would make a lot of the time over the course of me being in postpartum after having my daughter Isley and having my twin girls. She would always, every few weeks, make me a chicken pot pie. My dad is very, very gifted in the kitchen. Like he loves it. He loves to get on his green egg and grill and smoke ribs and do all those things. But all of that has kind of taken place later once they really came off the road full time. So to answer your question, my grandmother, my dad's mom, my daddy grew up real close to Charleston, South Carolina. And when I was five years old, my grandparents, his parents, Rose and WM, moved to Nashville to help take care of me when they were gone. And so, I mean, we would have the epitome of of Southern food on our table every night. And my grandfather would get home from work and it was about 90 minutes to the second he walked through the door that we would have dinner on the table. And, and it was butter beans and okra with some awesome like ham in there too over rice. Oh, Everything's over rice. <laughs> Everything's over rice. Um, and she would make just homemade chicken and dumplings and the way that she prepared those, it was more like not such a thick broth. It was more of a thin broth. So almost more like a soup and homemade everything. Steak and gravy, pot roast, collard greens. It really was, that's just the way, like the generation she grew up in and what her mama made and her family, that was that was it. So I was always full, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so if they were from Charleston, did they like to make any of those low country things like shrimp and grits? So that's something that my dad does a lot. We didn't do a ton of seafood. Have you ever heard of something called chicken bog? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So that was another one, just really delicious, like flavorful chicken, chicken broth, salt and pepper and rice. And it would just cook basically into a casserole. But that's another one of my favorite things, stewed tomatoes. Oh my gosh. It's my mouth's watering and it, and it, it really, it's amazing how, and I know y'all talk so much about this, how connected your feelings, not just memories, but your feelings and your emotions are to food, especially when it's around family and the family table. And so, yes, it was a it was a lot of those types of dishes, but not as much seafood. I feel like my parents, when we would go travel somewhere, they would always expose me to different things. I remember having sushi for the first time when I was like eight or nine, loving it and loving the experience of it. But that was obviously not the norm yeah. <laughs> of what I had at, at home growing up. So you did a gospel album called Love Remains in 2016, and you said at the time that it was a tribute to your grandfather, who had passed away a few years earlier. Yes. It seems like you really had a special relationship with him. What are some things that he kind of taught you growing up? Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking. He will have been gone 10 years this year. So it's definitely a milestone year and just grieving him not being on this earth anymore. So I've been thinking a whole lot about him and the things that I miss. And I will say there was such a sense of safety. He was a tall man. He was like six one. He's worked out a lot. So until he got into his 70s, I mean, he would be up every morning 
between 3.30 and 4 in the morning, he would go out, he would do his workout. He had a chin-up bar outside that he would go out there. I mean, he was so dedicated to taking care of his health, which was really amazing to have and be able to witness as a young girl growing up, just his his real dedication to the routine and how important I think that is for us as people to have kind of our rhythms and our routines that we do that I think help ground us in what can feel like a world that's spinning out a lot, you know? And so that's one thing that he really instilled in me that I'm so appreciative of. And that brought safety. I felt like my grandfather is so strong. He could take anybody down. I think another thing that I love about him and miss about him was he was hilarious. He had the best sense of humor and he had this big booming voice that you walked into the room and if he said something, and especially if he was like in a moment of wanting to make you laugh or excited about something, it would hit you in your (laughs) chest. And my dad has always said he kind of has that Foghorn Leghorn Looney Tune cartoon voice. Like I, I said, boy, it's time to go. Da, 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 you know, whatever he would say. And he always called all of the women in our family, my grandmother, me, my little sister, my aunt, his only daughter, um, Sugar. So, <laughs> hey, Sugar, have you had a good day, Sugar Babe? You know, just so loving. I miss that. I miss his voice and not knowing what's going to come out of his mouth next. He was to be so predictable in his daily routine. (laughs) He was so unpredictable in what was going to come out of his mouth. (laughs) (laughs) Those nicknames are such a Southern thing. (laughs) Yes, yes. So you're very open about your faith, Hillary, and you grew up in a very Christian family, And I'm wondering if the church was also important to you in terms of discovering music. Yes, absolutely. I grew up going to church. My parents had me in from the time I was in the nursery. And then I was so blessed to be given the opportunity to go to a Christian school from fifth grade through graduation. And that was, you know, the kind of years where my mom and dad were gone a good bit. You know, they were on the road and and so having that place, that foundation of faith in church and in school was really crucial to me. And I sang in both places. I would sing in school because we would have a Wednesday chapel every week. And once I got into high school, I helped lead worship there. And then when I started driving in, in youth group at church, I started leading worship there as well. We were kind of of a more traditional kind of Southern Baptist church that we would use a hymnal. But then over the years, as I got a little bit older, we started introducing a little bit more like praise and worship music, which I really gravitated towards a lot. There was just something that opened up in my heart. I love the old hymns and they they mean so much to me. And the older I get, the deeper they mean. But there was something about the worship music that it just led me kind of in a different direction. And that was where I started to really find just the deeply personal relationship with God through music. And so it definitely made a huge, huge impact on me. It helped me learn harmony. I mean, I remember my parents were never in the choir when I was growing up, but when we would be sitting in the pew, I would hear mom always take the high third harmony with the rest of the choir. And so I was like, that sounds different. And my dad would take the fifth below or, you know, and so I was kind of hearing a full choir, like to my left and right, you know, (laughs) with them singing along and just recognizing like, oh, she's singing different notes, but it still blends. And I think those are things that just kind of soaked in um, as I was growing up. Was that also important to you in terms of getting comfortable on a stage? Absolutely. That coupled with We did a family Christmas show out at at Gaylord Opryland Hotel when I was a junior and senior in high school in my freshman year of college. And it was the Linda Davis family Christmas show. And so between the day or two before Thanksgiving and Christmas Day, we would do one to two shows a day of a, a full production. And so between school 
and church and that experience, those were where I really got my chops up, so to speak, on how to perform. Now, performing Christmas music is a very specific thing. (laughs) So it's not like all of that translates over into a regular album and music. And But by that time, I was writing as well a lot in Nashville country songs, trying to kind of work on my on my career from about the age of 16. So all of those were definitely the building blocks of what led to what I'm doing now. We'll continue with Hillary Scott of Lady A after the break. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and we're talking with Lady A's Hillary Scott. So even though you were born into this family and surrounded by all this music, your success as an artist was not automatic. I mean, you had a lot of rejection. Over the years, you auditioned for American Idol and got rejected. Twice. <laughs> oh, twice. <laughs> <laughs> you performed for industry people and, and got rejected. Was there ever a time when you kind of thought, I'm out, this was not meant to be? So I got a development deal, which is basically, if a recording contract is like the pinnacle, a development deal would be a step below that, if not a couple steps below that. It's when you go in and you connect with a label, specifically someone in A&R, and they see something in you and they are willing to give you a year, sometimes a little bit more to develop and record, write, just get more experience. And so I was given that opportunity and it was going really well. I was working with a producer and also a songwriter who had come to one of the Christmas shows actually the first year. Her name is Victoria Shaw and she approached me and she was like, I'd love to work with you. We can take this slow. I want you to finish high school and, you know, make all of the memories that are so important, but you're really talented. I see something in you. So it took a couple years of working with her. And then we get this opportunity to have this development deal. And the big kind of moment at the end of a development deal is you showcase. So you find a small club or venue and You invite as many people, friends, family, but mainly industry people as you possibly can, and you perform these songs that you've been either recording or working on over the year. And it was packed. It was wall-to-wall people. It felt like it went great. I go backstage after the last song, and the head of the label comes back there and is like, that was great. Where are you going to dinner to celebrate? And I was like, well, that sounds promising. <laughs> That's kind of a promising sentence to hear yeah, from yeah. the head of the label. And I said, well, I've had family travel in, so we'll probably just go grab some dinner. And well, by 9 a.m., 9.30 the next morning, they had called my producer and said, we've decided to go a different direction. And I was 19, almost 20, and I was devastated I felt a little let on, to be honest. You know, I felt like that was kind of carrot dangling language (laughs) of like that I may have had this like in the bag and I was going to get good news the next day. And so I was so sad. That was definitely the lowest point of just, I'll never forget going into Victoria's office and just sitting there and being just so deflated. And I don't know what else we could have done to do this better or to have presented ourselves and myself as an artist in a more true, authentic way. And like, they said that they loved it. So why, you know, all of those questions. And that was in March of 2006. And I met my bandmates in May. So it was really one of those moments of like, sometimes the Lord just slams a door shut. And then the next, you know, very near future, one bus wide open. And I wasn't going to give up. I I knew that I would be in this industry in some capacity and truly that God had a plan for me in my life within music. But I had no idea that two months later, literally my world would change 
forever. And I'm just so, so grateful for that. You know, I I don't think you can feel full joy and appreciation for something unless you felt the opposite. If you felt what it feels like to really be heartbroken over something or feeling defeated or feeling like, gosh, I thought they saw something in me and using that as fuel to just persevere. And also at the same time, like how someone else chooses to see you or define you does not change how worthy and valuable you are to the world and that you belong just for being here, you know, and that you deserve to be loved for just existing. And I think that was a huge lesson that that taught me too of like, you know what, I've still got a lot to offer. I'm only 20 years old. There's so much more to be done. And I'm not going to let this one experience deter me from continuing to move forward. Well, it certainly didn't. And you met Charles Kelly and Dave Haywood after that. And yes, I won't ask you to retell that story of of how y'all came together, but now you've been together as a band for 15 years. 15 years, yes. Which is... <laughs> we just released our eighth studio album. It's remarkable. I mean, how have y'all been able to stay together for so long and what makes it work? You know, I think, first of all, I have to just acknowledge that I think it is by the grace of God that we are here and that we formed as a band and that we're also still together stronger than ever, truly, in our relationship and our friendship. But it's it's taken work. But I think ultimately, we just really like each other. We enjoy creating together and we make each other laugh and we have such a, a, a true foundation of friendship. And we're all very different people. We come from different backgrounds, are starting from our different places. But when we come together, I think we all recognize that what we create, what we do is greater than the sum of its parts. We all share the same belief that we have been brought together for a reason, but we are individuals with our own individual families that are then having to come together as a band to make business decisions, creative decisions that impact our families. So it's very complex, but it's been really incredible how we've all continued to learn to listen and to empathize with one another and really just continue to lean in and not lean out. I think that's been one of the things that I'm the most thankful for is just As we've gone through everything we've gone through, one of the hardest years, arguably this past one, we leaned in. And without all of the other stuff that we'd worked through and overcome, I don't know if we would be on the other side of this last year in the same place as we are now, which is united and strong and excited for the future. Well, you guys just seem to be at the peak of your creative powers and collaboration right now. And as you said, you've got your eighth studio album now, and it's called What a Song Can Do, Chapter One. And it's a seven song set. I assume this means that there's might be a chapter two. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. there's definitely a chapter two. That'll be out later this year, and, and we'll be able to announce that in the coming months. But yeah, it's we wanted to really release music differently this time. I mean, on all of our albums, we've really tried to never put filler in, make a song just like hold a place. That's, there's always been a specific purpose for each song that we've put on a record. But it's also, we live in a time and, and I myself have a hard time consuming that much music at once. And so for us, we were just excited to be able to kind of do this in two chapters. So hopefully... There's more light and time given to each individual song on the project because these first seven specifically, I mean, we love them all. We've always said that's like these these songs are our babies and we want, you know, we just want them to have a chance to go and live the life that they're meant to have. And so we felt like this was a way for there to be a little bit more emphasis on each individual song and hoping that the fans and, and anyone who listens 
can really hear that and, and experience it. Well, there is a wonderful song on there called Worship What I Hate. And it really feels like kind of a response to this world that we're all living in. I mean, so many of us wake up in the morning and look at a screen right away, and it doesn't necessarily make you feel good. Right. What were y'all trying to get at with this song? Oh, um, that one was a, a real, just honest, vulnerable, like, here's the unhealthy ways that I'm coping with life. Dave Haywood and I wrote this song with Amy Wodge and Natalie Hemby, and it was in September of 2020, so we were just all, you know, in it. There's just no way to predict how much longer it's going to be until we can tour again, and we're in this place of we've been our kids' parents, and we've been their teachers, and we've been all of the things that we're trying to juggle over this last year plus. But I'll be honest that a lot of what this song talks about aren't just things that I've struggled with through 2020. (laughs) They're things that I've been struggling with for years, whether it be having my phone in my hand and the phantom vibrate that happens where you think your phone vibrates and you have a message and you look down and you don't. And it's like another appendage. And I just really felt like I was starting to see how negative it was impacting me. And then if you listen to the first verse of of that song, it's about comparison and it's about perfectionism and it's about really how much time we waste living in this spiral of shame of the ways that we don't measure up when really if we could change our thinking and just make a slight little turn in our perspective and focus on what we can do to be better versions of ourselves that changes everything. It shifts our entire focus and how we see ourselves, how we see the world. You know, when I'm not consuming the 24-hour news cycle, I'm a lot more positive. (laughs) I feel a lot more hope when I get out and just have, you know, cookouts with my friends and see their kids love on my kids. And I'm not just so consumed by what we are inundated with every day. And it's not to say that we don't need to be educated on what's going on and that we don't need to learn and grow and and be aware, but it was starting to just steal my joy. And that song, it's really kind of sad and vulnerable, but it's also redemptive. And that's what I want people to hear more than anything is like, once you know something, you can't unknow it. And now it's what do you do with it? And I think that to me would be my message around this song is, is is if it hits you, if it strikes a chord in you and and it makes you feel like, oh man, that is me. Like, oh, make sure that you take a second and realize like you're acknowledging that, you know that there's a self-awareness and that is huge. And now what can you do with it? That song to me is like, it's a mission almost as much as it's, a message. Hillary, would you mind singing a verse or so of that song? Yeah, absolutely. I keep looking at myself in the mirror, hoping it will change. And I keep wishing for a brand new body that I didn't have to blame. I'm seeing every flaw like a failure, using every cure like a savior, like trying to build a church out of all my hurt when it really needs grace. I gave all my time to nothing. I focused on who It's just a beautiful song. It's a beautiful message. And and I love that y'all are getting that out in the world. Thank you so much. It really means so much that that's the song that you chose to highlight today. And yeah, I hope it makes people think. I think there's songs that are just supposed to make you dance around your living room and forget. And I think there are songs that are supposed to just make you think. And I hope that this one does.
Well, Hillary, so you have three young daughters, and as someone who was on the road nonstop, kind of like your own parents, what did this past year mean to you to have so much time with the family? This last year was in so many ways challenging, but I would also have to say like it was a huge, huge gift. And I think the reason why is because my daughter's almost eight. She'll be eight the end of July. My twins are three and a half. And this is all time that only happens once. These are all things and seasons that only happen once, you know, and to have every day with them, to not have a half packed suitcase in the corner of my closet, like to really be able to soak them up in all of the joy and all of the tears and all of the feeling overwhelmed and having my two little toddlers like ganging up on me. <laughs> I mean, in all of the ups and downs of of what it's been, it is an answer to prayer. And it did not look anything like I thought it would. But I will say I have my husband to thank. He is just so wise in helping me just kind of get some perspective. And, and he's like, there might never be another time in their life growing up that this happens. And so let's be intentional with spending this time with them. I think that these months that I've been able to have with my girls, how does that change the trajectory of their life? And I think that there's a lot of ways that we can look at this last year and a half for our kids and and we're deep in grief and sadness. And there's so much that has been so challenging for children and for young people over this time. And I also think that we've, as parents, been given more opportunity to sit with our kids and talk to them and help them navigate big feelings. And that has been something that I've been really grateful for with my girls and my husband. Absolutely. Well, Hillary, I just have one more question. What does it mean to you to be Southern? That's a great question. I would say... For me, it is when I think about the women specifically in my life who helped raise me, who helped nurture the person that I am now, what I hope it means for me and for others, and especially as a woman, is a kindness and a hospitality. That's the first word when I think about my grandmother, who I spent many, many of my most formative years with. She was so hospitable and she was so kind. And I just appreciate that in her so much. My mom as well, the other women, Southern women in my life. But for me, it's it's a posture of heart and just wanting to be kind and wanting to be hospitable and empathetic and a lot of people would answer that question very differently. And that's what's beautiful about it. But for me, it's just wanting to continue to be kind, keep people's bellies full when they're in my house (laughs) with comforting food with a lot of love poured into it and just loving, empathetic conversation around our dinner table. I mean, that that's it to me. Um, And the lightning bugs outside, (laughs) you know, it really like being able to just experience the beautiful green and um, yeah, it's all about relationship for me, for sure. Well, that's a beautiful answer. And hopefully we'll have those lightning bugs around for a long time. Yes. (laughs) I hope so, because my little girls sure love them. (laughs) Well, Hillary Scott of Lady A, thank you so much for being on Biscuits and Jam. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Hillary Scott. You can find Lady A's new album, What a Song Can Do, Chapter 1, wherever you get music. Join me back here next week as I chat with the legendary Amy Grant. To be Southern means to have spent a lot of your childhood barefoot. To be Southern is a table with extra places set or ready. To be Southern is talking slower and telling stories. Southern to me is gentle. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. This podcast was produced and edited in Nashville, Tennessee. 
If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or telling your friends about the program. You can find us online at southernliving.com and subscribe to our print publication by searching for Southern Living at www.magazine.store. Biscuits and Jam is produced by Heather Morgan Schott, Chrissy Tiglius, and me, Sid Evans, for Southern Living. Thanks also to Ann Kane, Jim Hankey, Danielle Roth, Matt Sav, Erica Wong, and Rachel King at Pod People. We'll see you here next week for more Biscuits and Jam. Mm-hmm.